Well, hello, Mount Pleasant. Would you stand with us as we prepare to worship the Lord? We're so glad you're here. Tonight's going to be a little bit different. You know, a lot of times we start maybe with something big and upbeat and celebratory in nature. And uh, I was reminded this week of Psalm 95. The psalm starts out with, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. And sometimes there's that celebration and that shouting, but then further down, just a few more verses, it says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. And what it talks about when it says bowing down is being in the presence of the King. And tonight we're gonna be in the presence of the Lord and we just wanna worship in his throne room. And so we're very purposefully just gonna make things a little more simple because I want us to just raise our voices together tonight. And hopefully these songs are a little bit more familiar to you as we worship. Would you sing this with me? When the music fades and all is stripped away, can I simply come? Longing just to Sing it today. I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It. It's all about you. Yes, Lord.
tonight. it to Yes. 
your voices. All is at rest. I and my Savior am happy
Come on, let's just give him praise tonight. We glorify your name, Father. You are worthy. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Christians are called to persevere. And the implications of that call, uh, they range far and wide because I feel like they cover everything from just the need to have a consistent time with God each day to the ability to trust God in the face of, of deep difficulty and confusion. But our ability to persevere is not something that is born out of our own strength. It is something that comes from God. Listen to these two verses from Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I love both those verses. That's why I read them to you tonight. But honestly, we're just looking at the very beginning of verse 5 when Paul gives God the title, the God of endurance. This is crucial because what it does is it reminds us that our hope is not based on our ability to endure, but it's based on God's ability to endure. It's in his very nature. That's why he can call us to do it. And the truth is, nowhere do we see this and celebrate this more than when we remember the fact that he endured the cross for us, for our sakes, and for the joy set before him. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we prepare to take communion tonight, Lord, I pray that we would celebrate and rejoice and rest and be glad in what you have done. And that while we are called to persevere and called to live a life worthy of you, we can also have peace because we know that our salvation is not based on our ability to get it right all the time, but on the fact that you endured for our sakes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great to greet all of you, all of you joining us in person, all of, you, all of you who are worshiping with us online. And as always, I want to give a real special welcome to all of you folks at our Church Anywhere location down in the old Southside neighborhood. It's great to have everybody with us this weekend. If you have a Bible, I want you to go ahead and grab it and go with me to the Old Testament book of Numbers. Find the book of Numbers. It's the fourth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So that should be pretty simple. You can find that. And while you're doing that, real quick, um, during, out, during the month of January, we're using these little white cards that you're going to receive when you walk into the worship center uh, on the weekend as a way to help us identify folks who have returned to in-person worship. Here's what I want you to understand. If you grabbed one of these last week and you filled it out and you dropped it in one of the gray baskets outside the worship center, which is what you need to do again this weekend if you didn't do it last week. But if you did it last week, you don't have to do it again. Just one time, okay? See how easy that is? Easy, easy, easy. So just make sure. And I was surprised at the amount of cooperation we had last week because some of you, I mean, let's just be honest. You're not very cooperative. All right. I want to go out on a limb this weekend and guess that with just a few exceptions, uh, most of you have never really spent much time reading through the book of Numbers. And honestly, I can understand that because that 
is nothing about that title that makes it sound like a particularly interesting book. I mean, who writes a book and calls it Numbers? That, that, that's nothing that makes you want to think, man, I really want to dig into that. That sounds fascinating to me. Uh, maybe if you were an actuary or something like that, you'd be drawn to the book of Numbers, but uh, other people, not so much. In fact, unless you're someone who has read all the way through the entire Bible, probably following some read-through-the-Bible plan, you may have never even darkened the door of the book of Numbers, and I understand that. Just out of curiosity, this past week, I, I got online and I googled uh, different ways that people have outlined the book of Numbers, and I found this one from author and pastor Charles Swindoll, well-known, great preacher, great writer, great man of God, and he broke down the book of Numbers into three basic points, preparation, pessimism, and punishment. Now, preparation, that's okay. Pessimism, eh, maybe. Punishment, no thanks. No thanks. I mean, nobody's going to see that and think, I can't wait to read that book. But what I want you to know this weekend as we kick off this, this study on the book of Numbers is that there is great, great value for all of us in reading and studying this Bible book for multiple reasons. I only have time to mention four. This will be a little bit of a lengthy introduction since this is the first message of the series. Let me give you four reasons as quickly as I can on why we should all be involved in reading and studying the Old Testament book of Numbers. And the first one is this. Regardless of the name, it's action-packed. Write that down somewhere. The book of Numbers is actually action-packed. Here's the deal. The book of Numbers begins with the record of a census and the arrangement of the tribes of Israel. So it starts off slow. I'll be the first to say that. Even though those details are an important part of the book, it starts off slow. But after that, the book of Numbers is basically about the Israelites' journey through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And there's some incredible things that happen during that time. The reason why this book is called the book of Numbers is because there is an emphasis in the book placed on numbers. As I just mentioned, it begins with a census of the people, and that census is, des is designed to identify how many fighting men there are among the Israelites. And then another census is going to be taken later in chapter 26. So there is an emphasis on counting and ordering God's people, the Israelites. There's no question about that. The reason why it has the name Numbers is because of that. But that wasn't the original title for this book. That's the, that's the title that came when the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew to something that was called the Greek Septuagint, but that wasn't the, the name or the title of this book in the beginning. The original Hebrew title, remember the Old Testament was originally written in the Hebrew language, the original Hebrew title for this book comes from the first verse in the book, which really comes from one single word in the Hebrew language, and when you translate that one single word from Hebrew to English, then this is what you get, in the wilderness or in the desert, which is a much more accurate description of what this Old Testament book is about, especially after you get past Numbers chapter 10. Here's what we need to know and understand about the book of Numbers. After God used Moses, and you remember this story, to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, after they passed through the Red Sea. You remember that story? Pharaoh changed his mind and was chasing them down. They had the Red Sea behind them and the army of Pharaoh uh, ahead of them and the army of Pharaoh behind them. And God supernaturally parted the waters and they passed across uh, the Red Sea on dry ground. After that happened, after they were given manna to eat in the wilderness and water to drink, after they stopped at a place called Mount Sinai and they received the law of God that included the Ten Commandments along with multiple manifestations of the presence of God so that they would know for sure that it was God who was leading them, there came a time when Moses, as they drew close to the promised land, sent 12 spies into the promised land to scout it out for 40, everyone say 40, 40 days, for 40 days. Now, you know how this goes. If you were kid growing up in Sunday school like I was, then you learned the song, 12 men went to spy on Cain, and 10 were bad, and 2 were good, right? What did they see when they spied on Cain, and 10 were bad, and 2 were good? Some saw giants big and tall. Some saw grapes and clusters fall. Some saw God ruled over all. Ten were bad and two were good. So ten came back and they said, man, there's no way we can enter the promised land. The people are too large. They're too strong. The cities are too fortified. We'll be slaughtered. 
But only two of them, two named Joshua and Caleb, said, because they believed in the power of God, they said, let's go. But all the people sided with the ten with the negative report and refused to enter in the promised land. And what happened as a result of that is God decided that they would spend the next 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, wandering in the wilderness one year for every day that those 12 men scouted out the promised land. And the other purpose for that was that an entire generation of them would die in the wilderness. They would never, ever step foot in the promised land because of their unbelief. And that's After you get past a certain point in the book of Numbers, that's what the book of Numbers is about, that wandering in the wilderness. And it is an action-packed book. Let me give a second reason why we should study it, because it reveals the thoughts and the feelings of God. The book of Numbers reveals the thoughts and the feelings of God. I want you to think about something with me for a minute. As Christians, we believe that God is speaking through every verse in the Bible because he is the author of every verse. But, everyone say but. But, there are times in the Bible where we see, where we read the thoughts and the feelings of God in unmistakable ways. And the book of Numbers is one of the places where there are many of those examples. Let me give you one. In Numbers chapter 11, the Israelites begin to complain because they're tired of eating manna. I wish we had time to go back to Exodus chapter 16 and talk all about the story of how God provided manna for them while they were in the the wilderness, while they were in the desert. But they got tired of eating manna, and they began to complain. And this is the kind of thing that they were saying. This is um, early on there in uh, Numbers chapter 11. They were saying, if we only had meat to eat, and we remember the fish we ate in Egypt, also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onion, and garlic. And God heard that. He heard their complaining, and he heard the things that they were whining about. And so God basically says, you want some meat? I'm going to give you some meat. And this is what Numbers chapter 11, verse 19, the very first part of verse 20 says. He says, you will not eat it because he sent quail. That was the meat that he provided. He said, you will not eat it just one day or two days or five, 10 or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. That's what he said. You think there's some emotion in those words from God? Absolutely there were. And he tells us why in the latter part of Numbers chapter 11 and verse 20, because he goes on to say, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Now, let me cut to the chase. What is God saying in the latter part of Numbers chapter 11 and verse 20? He's saying, listen, I'm taking this personally. That's what he's saying. Because basically you're saying, God, you're not doing your job. And you're saying, God, you're not enough. And so we see the very real thoughts and feelings of God all throughout the book of Numbers. Here's the third reason why we should read and study the book of Numbers. Because it's referenced in the rest of the Bible. It's referenced in the rest of the Bible. We, have, we don't have time to go into this into detail, but I will say this. Not knowing the content of the book of Numbers could possibly hinder your ability to fully understand some other parts of the Bible. Uh, I'll just give you one example, and not just understand them, but in some cases maybe fully appreciate other parts of the Bible. I always say that John 3.16 is is what I call arguably the most familiar verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But before Jesus spoke those words in John 3 uh, that are so familiar, he referenced a story that comes from Numbers chapter 21. And so this is what Jesus says right before John 3, 16, this is verses 14 and 15. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man, and remember that's his favorite way to refer to himself, the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then he goes into John 3, 16. Well, Numbers 21 tells us about a time when God's people, shockingly, were rebellious and sinful. And because of that, venomous snakes came into their camp, and many of the people who were bitten died. Well, the people, they didn't want any part of that, so they went to Moses, and they repented. They, they said, we're sorry for our rebellion. We're sorry for our sin. And they asked him, please pray and ask God to take all of this away. And so Moses prayed for the people, and God told Moses to do an unusual thing. He said, I want you to take 
a bronze snake, make a bronze snake, and I want you to put it up on a pole, and when someone is bitten, I want you to instruct them that if they look up at the bronze snake, that they would be healed and that they would live. Now, I just summarized a story, listen to me, with a lot of meaning in just a few words, and that's not fair to the story. But the bottom line is this, and this is what this example tells us as well as other examples that we can find in the book of Numbers. All throughout the book of Numbers, as God's people were in the wilderness, God was teaching them about himself. He was teaching them about their own sin, their own rebellion, the danger of that. And he was also teaching them about faith. And this is one of the examples where he was teaching them about faith. Because it was totally illogical to think that looking at the image of a bronze snake, looking up at the image of a bronze snake could heal you from a, a venomous snake bite. But that's what God told them to do because God wanted them to learn the power of faith. He knew it would be that act of faith that would cause them to be healed. And years later, in John chapter 3 and verse 14, we just read that, Jesus basically said that snake that was lifted up that the people had to look up at, that illogical response was a foreshadowing, or we might say a typical prophecy of what would happen in his own life many years later. Because just like it was illogical to think that you could look at the image of a snake and be healed, how illogical was it, do you think, when Jesus was beaten, bruised, bludgeoned, and dying on a cross for people to think, if I look up at that, the lowest, seemingly lowest moment in Jesus' life, the moment when he seemed the least like the Messiah, that that is what brings spiritual healing into my life, but that's exactly what does. Well, there's a whole lot more I could say about that, but I need to keep going. Let me give you a fourth reason real quick why we should read and study the Old Testament book of Numbers, and that's because it is written as a word of warning. It is written as a word of warning. Remember the book of Hebrews says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. And we can learn a lot from the Old Testament book of Numbers because it's a gift to us so that we can learn from the mistakes of others and friends. That's about as simple a way as I can say it. And so we really need to spend some time reading and studying the Old Testament book of Numbers. Excuse me. Some of you who are here probably remember that several years ago, we, along with other churches around uh, the world, were involved in a lengthy sermon series that was called The Story. The Story. And we started in Genesis chapter 1, and we worked our way all the way to Revelation chapter 22, looking at the Bible as one big story connecting all the dots. And probably the thing that people remember the most about that message series called The Story was this one thing that was emphasized over and over again, that in God's story, there's an upper story and there's a lower story. How many of you remember what I'm talking about? That really resonated with all of us. There's an upper story and a lower story. God lives in the upper story. We live in the lower story. And in the lower story, we're not always able to see what God is doing. In the lower story, we don't, we, we're not always able to see the things that God can see. And from his position in the upper story, he knows what's best. He's directing the reality of our lives. Well, that's really a, very similar to what we're going to uh, be seeing as we go through some selected passages in the Old Testament book of Numbers. That's why we're calling this series a view from the top, because we're going to get a view from where God lives about everything that was going on in the lives of the Israelites, and it's going to teach us. It's going to equip us. It's going to encourage us, and it's going to guide us. Uh, we have to remember that God's ways and our ways are often very different. No one articulated that better than the prophet Isaiah when he wrote these words in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Look at them with me on the screen. In fact, read, read them with me. Let me hear your voice. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Again, there's a picture of an upper story and a lower story. There's a reminder that God views life from the top. And so, we're going to be, we're going to learn about that. We're going to be reminded of that as we look at some different passages in the book of Numbers. Now, I know that was a long introduction, but if you've got your Bibles open to Numbers chapter 1 and you're able this weekend, go ahead and stand with me and we're going to read some scripture together. It's going to be a little bit of an unusual passage of scripture because what we're going to do is we're going to read Numbers chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. 
And then you got to pay attention because then we're going to skip all the way down to Numbers chapter 1, verse 49. And we're going to read from verse 49 in chapter 1 to verse 2 of chapter 2, okay? And so if you get lost, just look at the screen. How about that? Here we go. First of all, the first four verses of the book. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. He said, take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listing every man by name, one by one. You and Aaron are to number by their divisions all the men in Israel, 20 years old or more, who are able to serve in the army. One man from each tribe, each the head of his family, is to help you. Now go down to verse 49. We pick it up in verse 49, and again, we see some instructions about this census. You must not count the tribe of Levi or include them in the census of the other Israelites. Instead, appoint the Levites to be in charge of the tabernacle of the testimony over all its furnishings and everything belonging to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings. They are to take care of it and encamp around it. Whenever the tabernacle is to move, the Levites are to take it down. And whenever the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall do it. Anyone else who goes near it shall be put to death. The Israelites are to set up their tents by divisions, each man in his own camp under his own standard. The Levites, however, are to set up their tents around the tabernacle of the testimony so that the so that wrath rather will not fall on the Israelite community the Levites Levites are to be responsible for the care of the tabernacle of the testimony the Israelites did all this just as the Lord commanded Moses the Lord said to Moses and Aaron the Israelites are to camp around the tent of meeting some distance from it each man under his standard with the banners of his family. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask that God would bless the reading and the hearing of his word. As I already told you, the book of Numbers begins with a census of the people to find out how many fighting men there were among them. And while there's so much more to the book of Numbers than that, because I told you it tells the story of the Israelites as they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, there are some really important things that we can learn from this first census. Uh, maybe I should say there are some important things that we can learn from the instructions related to this first census. And there are three of them that I'm going to share with you uh, this weekend. And the, th the three things that I'm going to share with you that were related to the Israelites in the book of Numbers are just as relevant to every one of us today. And so if you're someone who likes to take notes, I want to encourage you to write down this first thing. I want you to write down number one. The first thing we're going to see is the desire of God. Write that down somewhere. The desire of God. And to put it simply, and I'm, I'm, I'm having to paraphrase some things and connect the dots for you without reading the scriptures together, uh, but to put it simply, the desire of God was to be at the center of who the people of Israel Israel were and to be at the center of every single part of their lives. We didn't have time this weekend to read the details of how the people were supposed to set up their camp. If you want to go home and read that in Numbers chapter 2, I would encourage you to do that. But for our purpose together, let me just give you a description. The tabernacle, which was like a portable temple, which was for the Israelites, the very presence of God was to be in the very center of the people. There were to be three tribes below it, three tribes above it, three tribes to the left of it, and three tribes to the right of it. I think we have a picture we can show you there of how it was supposed to be set up. Now, as you look at that picture on the screen, let me ask you a question real quickly. Do you think it's a coincidence knowing that God is the author of all things that it looks like a cross? Absolutely no coincidence there. And with this order, with this arrangement, God was telling his people, the Israelites, I want you to make my presence the primary focus of your camp. I want you to make my presence the primary focus of your lives. And this, friends, is God's desire for all all people, including you and me today. He wants to be at the center of all of our lives. 
In Exodus chapter 20, and you may be familiar with that Old Testament passage, Moses goes up Mount Sinai, and this is what we read in the first three verses. He goes up Mount Sinai, and this is where Moses receives the Ten Commandments. Verses 1 through 3 of Exodus chapter 20 say, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then he says, You shall have no other gods before me. It was the first thing, the first commandment that he gave them. And then right after that, right after that, he told them that they were not to make idols of any form, of any type. God wanted first place in the lives of his people, the Israelites, and he wants first place in your life and my life today as well. I told you the next commandment was a commandment forbidding idols, when we think of idolatry, we often think about some literal statue or some literal physical object that people might worship or pray to. But you and I know, practically speaking, that an idol is anything, anything at all we put before God. If I were going to make that even more practical for you this weekend, I would say that an idol is anything in our lives that we think we can't live without. Think about that with me for a minute. An idol really is anything in your life or my life apart from God that we think we can't live without. Think about your life for just a minute. Think about the desires of your life. Think about the pursuits of your life. Think about the hobbies, the activities of your life. Is there something in your life that if somebody came along and said, you know what, you're going to have to do away with this, you're going to have to not be involved in this anymore, is there something in your life that you would think, that's just not possible for me, if that's the case? then you might be dangerously close to being involved in idolatry. See, here's what we need to understand. There are certain things in life that we need. We need joy. We need peace. We need fulfillment. We need satisfaction. We need love. And I could go on and on and on. You could fill in the blanks with a lot of different things. And the God who created us, the God who created us knows that the only place we can receive all of those things in a meaningful and a genuinely fulfilling and lasting way is from him. That's the only place. You and I know the world is full of people who are trying to find those things that are missing in their lives in the things of the world, and that will never work. It will never provide what they're looking for. And so it's a problem when we try to pursue other things in this world to meet the needs that only God, our creator, can meet. The understanding of that was something God's people, the Israelites, struggled with. If you know their, their story and their history, the understanding that all they needed was God and that, that all they needed to keep to, in their lives was to keep God at, in the center of their lives and give God first place in their lives. The understanding of that was something that they struggled with over and over and over again while they wandered in the wilderness. And that's why right from the beginning, God emphasized, even in a physical way, the way they set up their camp, that they needed to keep him center in the center point of their lives. And this will always be God's will for his people. All the way from the Israelites to you and me today, God wants to be the center of your life. He doesn't want to be anywhere else. He wants first place. He wants to be the center of your life and mine. Look at these words on the screen from Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. This psalmist says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now, if you believe those words are true, say amen. 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 But if we believe those words are true, then it's more than just affirming them with the word amen. We got to live our lives that way. If we believe that this earth has nothing that we desire besides God, then that needs to be reflected in the way we live our lives because that's the desire of God. It was the desire of God for the Israelites in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers, and it's the desire for you and me right now today. Write down the second thing that we can learn. The second thing is what we'll call the plan of God. Number one, the desire of God. Number two, the plan of God. If the desire of God is to have first place in the lives of his people, all the way from the Israelites to you and me today, then the question that has to be asked is how does he make that happen? What is God going to do to help us live out that desire, be obedient to that will? 
Well, what we see in the book of Numbers is an answer to that question because what God did, at least for the Israelites, is he created a priesthood. That was the answer in the book of Numbers. If the desire of God was, for, was to have first place in their lives, to be at the center of their lives, then the plan of God to help make that happen was the creation of a priesthood. Look back at these words we read a few minutes ago from Numbers chapter 1, verses 49 and 50. This is what we read. You must not count. Remember, they were, they were taking a census of all the people to determine how many men could be in the army. But then you get to verse 49 of chapter 1, and we read these words. But you must not count the tribe of Levi or include them in the census of the, the other Israelites. Instead, appoint the Levites to oversee the tabernacle of the testimony over all its furnishings and everything belonging to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all of its furnishings. They are to take care of it and encamp around it. Now, friends, here's why this is so significant. When God created the priesthood, what he was doing was he was creating a way for his people, the Israelites, to worship him. He was creating a way for the people to worship him. Because the Levites, the people of the tribe of Levi, were the ones God appointed to lead Israel in all things related to worship. God wanted to be center, the center of their lives. He, let me say it like this. He wanted them to treasure him. And so he created a priesthood to oversee worship that would help make that happen so that they could treasure God in their lives. There's a great verse, and every time I hear the word treasure, and you may be the same way, it makes me think of this verse in the, in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. It's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus, Jesus uh, basically sums up uh, a truth in real simple terms for us. He says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You remember that verse? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's Matthew 6, 21. Now, Jesus is, as I said, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about money and possessions, but we can take that verse out and, and use it and apply it because that verse falls in the category of what I call a truism. And what I mean by a truism is that verse is true in our lives all the time, regardless of the setting or regardless of the context. They those words will always be true. Your, your heart will always follow your treasure. Whatever you value the most, whether it's something material or something else, that's where your heart will always be. That is the meaning that we need to hang on to. And so here's a great, a great question for all of us. As we think about the plan of God, which is, which is worship, which helps us to keep him in the center of our lives, a great question for all of us would be, what do I value the most? As I live my life in this world today, what do I value the most? It's kind of like uh, just a moment ago when we were thinking about anything that might be an idol in our lives, anything that we think we can't live without in our lives. What do I value the most? Where do you find your identity? It, it, uh, what do you think about the most throughout the day? If someone, if you met somebody new after services and they said to, to you, tell me about yourself. What do you tell them about yourself? What would you ultimately end up talking about to tell them who you are, to give them a sense of your identity? The Bible makes it clear that God wants us to value him the most. He wants us to treasure him. That's what he wanted for the Israelites in the Old Testament, that's what he wants for you and me as followers of Christ today. And here's the thing. Worshiping him is one of the most significant ways we not only demonstrate that's true in our life, that he's the center of our lives and that we treasure him, but it's also a way that reinforces that truth in our life, reinforces for us the importance of keeping God in the center of our lives and making sure that we always treasure God and even though the way the Israelites worship God and the way we worship God today are very different, the priority of worship and the purpose of worship remains the same. That's why worship has got to be a priority in the life of every single believer, every single 
believer. We've all heard the comments, the countless comments, and read the comments. You know, you don't, you don't have to, for example, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And you know what? I would never argue that just on the pure measure of the point. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You, you, you don't have to go to church to really love God. You don't have to, to go to church. And when I say church, the imp implication is there. You don't have to be together in a setting for worship with other believers to be a Christian, to love God, to serve God, and any other thing that you might think of. But what worship does for us is it reinforces for us the central place that God has always desired to have in our lives. That's what it does. And my honest question in the course of a conversation, not to be argumentative at all because I don't have any interest in that, but my honest question to someone who would say, you don't have to go to church for, and you fill in the blank, whatever it is, would be this. Well, then how are you making time? How are you making a place, a space in your life to do that outside of that kind of opportunity. How are you doing it? That would be my question. And I would ask it honestly. Because worship helps us to reinforce in our lives this truth that God has first place, that he's the center of our lives. And worship is a great testimony to that when your worship is genuine and sincere. And worship has always been a responsibility and an opportunity for people who love God. Look at these words on the screen. First of all, Psalm 29 verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. I know you can worship God in all kinds of settings. But again, my question would be, is that exactly what you're doing? Psalm 95 and verse 6 says, come let us bow down and worship. Phil talked about this verse as we begin our, our time of standing and singing praise this weekend. Come let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Psalm 99 and verse 5 says, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. I don't know about you, I can't speak for you, but as we were singing those songs and our, our, our worship experience was a little different this weekend, man, I could feel the presence of God and the holiness of God in that moment. And in that moment, I know in my heart, he was the only thing that I thought about. He was my treasure. And my prayer is that that's true all the time. Let me give you a third thing, and we'll have to do this quickly. We see the desire of God. We see the plan of God. And the third thing is we see the grace of God. The grace of God. That might sound odd because we don't often associate the grace of God with the Old Testament. It's easy to associate the grace of God with the New Testament because the New Testament is centered on Jesus who is the embodiment of God's grace. And if you're not familiar with that word grace, the grace of God is simply the kindness and the favor of God that you and I don't deserve and that we could never earn. That's why Jesus was the embodiment of it because he came as God's gift of grace to the world. But the grace of God is also on display in different places in different parts of the Old Testament. And we see an example of the grace of God here in the very beginning of the book of Numbers in the role of the Levites who were the ones that were designated to oversee the worship for God's people. And I'm going to go back to Numbers chapter 1 verses 51 through 53. And these were the instructions, or a part of the instructions God gave to the Levites that were a part of the overall instructions for the taking of a census. Whenever the tabernacle is to move, the Levites are to take it down. And whenever the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall do it. Anyone else who goes near it shall be put to death. The Israelites are to set up their tents by divisions, each man in his own camp under his own standard. The Levites, however, to set up their tents around the tabernacle of the testimony so that wrath will not fall on the Israelite community. The Levites are to be responsible for the care of the tabernacle of the testimony. Now, I'll be the first person to say that that seems like an odd passage to point to when you're talking about the grace of God, especially when you go back and you consider that there was a threat of death connected to the tabernacle of the testimony and how close you got to it. But what we see here 
is the heart of God because as much as he wanted to be the center of the Israelites' lives, he also recognized that because the Israelites were sinful, just like you and me, that they were going to need a mediator or an intercessor in order to worship God, in order to come near to God in worship. And that's what the priests and the Levites were for the Israelites. They stood between the people and God in a way that allowed the people to worship God. And friends... I hope you see it, that reflects the grace of God. That's an incredible reflection of the grace of God. This holy God wanted a relationship with the Israelites where they worshiped him and they put him at the center of their lives. But because of his holiness and because of their sinfulness, that was going to be a problem. And so he created a way that didn't compromise his holiness. That's what he did when he created the priesthood. Well, how does that happen for people like you and me today? I hope you know the answer to that question. It happens when we recognize that Jesus is our mediator when it comes to God. The sole reason Jesus came into the world was to be the perfect once for all and once for all time mediator between us and God and make it possible for sinful people like you and me to live in a right relationship with God and have friendship with God and peace with God and fellowship with God. The New Testament talks about this a lot in the book of Hebrews, and I love these verses from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11, 12, where it it kind of uh, compares uh, the, the reality of the priests of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, to the reality of Jesus as our great high priest. And this is what it says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, talking about Jesus, this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's the grace of God that allows anyone the opportunity to come near to God. And we just saw how it happened for the Israelites in the book of Numbers And it happens through Jesus, through faith in Jesus for people today. In the Old Testament, the grace was seen in priesthood. In the New Testament, the grace is seen in Jesus. And listen, if you're here and you are listening to me and you don't, you, you've never experienced the reality of that, you, you don't know what it means to have to have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, the great high priest, the mediator for all of us, then we would love before you left this service to be able to explain that to you. And so what is the view from the top? And Phil and the team can come and we'll close. What is the view from the top that we need to focus on in this message? Well, I think it's really simple. It's just a reminder that regardless of what might be going on in your life or my life, regardless of any challenges or limitations you and I might be facing or that might be in front of us, God is always at work. There's never a moment when God doesn't see the needs and the challenges and the shortcomings of your life and mine. And because he is a God of love and mercy and grace, then he always makes a way. And if you're burdened, you're struggling, you feel lost, you feel like you're ready to give up, then I want you to know right now that God has a grace for you in your life with whatever you're struggling with. And if you turn to him, he'll share that grace with you. And you can trust that he has a plan for your life that includes your good and his glory. Father in heaven, thank you so much for some time in the scripture tonight. And I pray right now for anybody here who who might, you know, at one time have been able to say, you know, God is the center of my life. He's first place. He's my treasure, but maybe, maybe not so much today. I pray that you would touch their heart, and draw them closer to you, and know, help them to know that that can change right in this moment. 
if there's someone here who's just lost and hurting and struggling and uncertain and maybe filled with doubt, I pray that you would speak to their heart with the truth that you have a grace for them. It begins with Jesus. But whatever else, you have a grace for them. Whatever else they're facing, you have a grace that is sufficient for their need. They just have to draw near to you to experience it. Thank you for loving us the way you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing, let's sing one final song. Let's stand together and sing one final song. Sing that. I will believe for greater things. 